No? Zero, not a, how about now, three, two, one. Oh, hallelujah. If it starts squeaking on us, I'll grab up that handheld mic. Mm, one, two, three, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I wonder why that started. Oh, but I'm reminded of the pastor. Was going through the neighborhood, and he came up on a garage sale. There was a young boy out there, a microphone. The pastor was going through the neighborhood. Ooh, I love this. Uh, effects. You're in trouble now. And so he came up on a garage sale. A young boy was out on the driveway, and so the pastor rolled up on his bicycle, was looking around, and the boy, the, the boy was looking at that bicycle, and the boy finally said, you know what, uh, mister, I tell you what, I will trade you that bicycle for my lawnmower. And the pastor was looking at that lawnmower, and the pastor agreed, and the boy said, but you know what? I need to take your bicycle around the block and make sure it's going to be right for me. So the boy did, and the boy's riding around the, bike, riding around the block on the bicycle, and the, the pastor goes to try to pull start the lawnmower. So he's trying to pull start it. He couldn't get it started. So when the boy came back, the pastor said, you know, it looks like a pretty good mower, but I'm not real sure because it won't start. And the boy said, well, I really like your bike, so I think I'll keep that. But with the, with the lawnmower, you got to pull it some, and then you have to cuss at it. And the pastor said, I am a minister of the gospel. I do not curse. And the boy said, keep pulling. <laughs> Got a one cent sermon for you. Thank you, Ms. Peyton, for head, uh, helping us out on our media. Miss Molly Golden on the camera. J.J. Banks on our sound. And so thank you all for serving today. Our one cent sermon is this right here. God's saving grace. Say saving grace. Is our every single thing in the weeks leading up to today uh, I've been thinking about the subject of salvation and so I go through my notes and my phone and I've got subject matters and scriptures set out and they're parted out for certain dates and this and that and the other and so in prayer times and thought even conversations even with some of you I grab onto something and I think to myself that might be of God let's jot that down and see what happens well at some point this subject of salvation just it just would not leave me and so I decided today would be the day to talk about salvation. But I said, dear Lord Jesus, salvation that is so elementary level. Salvation, what? Are we going all the way back to the beginning now? And he said, yes, we're going all the way back to the beginning. So last night I was processing some thoughts and looking through some notes and sitting around in my room and it was about 10.30 at night, and I finished all of those sorts of things, and I felt pretty good about today. And I went online, and I was going to listen to Pastor Glenn Kite's message from last week. Great job, Pastor Glenn, and thank you very much for your ministry. I got out my cellular device, and I pressed play on the YouTube video, and there's Pastor Glenn, and he's wonderful picture. And it says something about the religiosity, or don't, don't allow the religiosity of this world, blah, 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 or the church, ruin your salvation. Am I close, Pastor Glenn? And I said, oh, wow, I must be on the right track. Furthermore, if I listen to this message, poof, tomorrow's going to be cheap and easy. I just get up, repeat a few things Pastor Glenn said. I know everybody loved it. We'll call it good and go home. I press play, and I got that little circle that goes, nothing I said devil get thee behind me and God said oh that's not the devil that's me you ain't getting off that easy boy <laughs> but I felt great about the fact are you sure we should do salvation we're going to talk about salvation and we are and thank you for sharing about salvation last week our one sentence sermon God's saving grace is our every single thing. Miss Peyton has a scripture in Genesis chapter 1 verse 20 or 30 something 31 and God saw everything that he had made and behold it was very good and the evening and the morning were the sixth day 
We're going all the way back to the beginning, talking about the beginning of your spiritual journey, which actually for most of you, including the disciples, salvation was not the beginning of your spiritual journey. Most of us, God had talked to and he'd shown himself real to long before we actually confessed with our mouth and believed in our heart that he is Lord and we became saved. Here in Genesis chapter 1, verse 31, this is the sixth day. Let me take you all the way back to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. The Bible says that God created the earth and it was formless and the dark, say dark, the dark hovered over the depths of the planet. But I got good news for you all the way back in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. The Bible says, yet God's presence hovered even over top of the dark, even way back then, first Genesis, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, you can see God triumphs over darkness. It's a prelude to every word, every chapter, every verse, every thought, everything, all the way through the Bible. The Revelation 22, you can see it coming like a freight train. Genesis chapter 1 tells us that God created light and darkness on the first day. Follow me here. On the second day, the Bible says God created the sky. On the third day, God created dry land and the sea. On the fourth day, God created plants and every tree on the planet. On the fifth day, God created animals. And on the sixth day, God gathered up some dust. He created a, an, an image in his own image. He created this thing, this beast. Oh, that's you and me. This something, this peculiar, this fearfully yet wonderfully made something. And he got down on his hands and knees and he breathed into the nostrils of Adam, the first man. Soon after, he created Eve. And he set them right in the middle of the Garden of Eden. Four great rivers flowed out of the Garden of Eden. The Pishon, the Gion, the Tigris, and the Euphrates. Still to this day, three of the four are the longest, largest rivers in the world. The Pishon, most scholars believe, is the Nile. Of course, the Euphrates and the Tigris speak for themselves. Throughout the land, there was gold and onyx. There was every tree under the sun that you can imagine. Try to look up the fruit trees in the world. The list is endless. Any type of food or fruit that you could imagine came off of vines and plants and trees. And God said, but don't eat off of the tree of life or the tree of good and evil. Now, how many of you have ever had children? It's like when you say do not, it's like spelled backwards means race over there as fast as you can and touch it. That's what it must mean. And so what did Adam and Eve do? They raced right over there and touched it. It wasn't for them. 99.9% .9 of everything in the world and the universe, all the galaxies, the stars so that we could keep time, the moon, the sun, the grass, the ocean, the mountains, the waves, salt, sugar. How many of you like sugar? Everything was made for you and I to enjoy. Love. How many of you ever been in love before? That's less than a third. The first service had more lovebirds. How many of you have been in love and you're sick and tired of being in love and you're not going back? Amen. The first service went hog wild over that. God created everything. He gave Eve to Adam, Adam to Eve. He gave them everything in the garden. He set them right in the middle of it. And he said 99.9% .9 of everything that you can see, that you can race to, run to, walk to, everything, it's yours. Enjoy it. Subdue it. Rule over it. Name it. Make it yours. It's yours. God's idea of a relationship with his children is to give us the absolute very best of everything he can absolutely imagine. But don't touch this. Don't touch this one thing, and we'll be cool. Name a fruit tree. What's your favorite fruit, fruit tree? Pears. We got a pear tree, Miss Peyton. 
Peach. We got a peach tree. I heard peach. Something else. Apple. Lemon. Got a lemon tree. Apple. Survey says 500 points for the something family. Any other tree? Fig. We got a fig tree. <laughs> Another fruit tree. Avocado. Avocado. <laughs> Ooh, that's two strikes. What? Orange. We got an orange tree. Mango. <laughs> we got an orange tree. We don't have an orange tree. Yeah, we have an orange tree. Put a picture of a lemon and let's call it an orange. Do something here. We're in Florida. Oh, plum tree. Plum tree. Grapefruit tree. Cherry tree. I, oh, the 40 fruit tree. This guy in Syracuse, he's a university professor. I know most of them are whacked, but this guy, he, this guy, he created something pretty cool. He grafted all these different tri- kinds of trees, and you can buy one of these, and you can plant these in your backyard. This thing produces 40 different kinds of fruit. Heller. God said, I'm going to give you everything your heart desires. Go enjoy it. (laughs) My dad's here today. I used to come running through the house and be messing around and doing not good stuff. And he would always say, I got five acres around here and you want to do that in the kitchen. (laughs) I'm thinking when God planted that tree, he said, I give you the whole world. And you go running to the one place I tell you not to. Eve goes over to the tree. She grabs some fruit off of it. She eats it, gives it to her husband, Adam. He eats it. They go walking through the Garden of Eden. God comes strolling through. God is probably thinking maybe grilled pineapple and some chicken breast for supper. He's in the mood to have a relationship with his people, his children. All of a sudden, he can't find Adam and Eve. He says, Adam, Eve, can't fire my house tonight. And they're hiding And he's like, "Uh uh-oh, uh-oh, what'd you do? And Adam said, it was this woman you gave me. Eve looked at the serpent and said, it was that serpent you gave us. Serpent looked at the tree and said, it was that tree. (laughs) It's human nature. And God was grieved. The end of the relationship that he had created with Adam and Eve at that point ceased to exist. It wasn't blameless any longer. It wasn't perfect anymore. There was a, there was a bond there, and that bond now had been broken. And then God did something extraordinary. The Bible says God then made the first sacrifice in the history of the world. He sacrificed some animal. We don't know what it was. But he clothed Adam and Eve with those garments. And we can see for the first time in the history of the world a sacrifice. It's a projection, of course, of the sacrifice Jesus Christ will make later. And God says, I tell you what, I love you, Adam and Eve. I'm going to sacrifice for you, and I'm going to cover you with my presence, with my love, with my goodness, and my mercy. And God, at that point in life, made the decision. He realized, I cannot live without my children. I've got to draw them close to me no matter what they do. Adam and Eve, they have Cain and Abel. Abel and Cain, they grow up. Abel brings an offering to God. When he does, it pleased God. Cain then brings an offering to God, and that offering was a less than. It was something that did not please God. God said, why do you bring me your junk? I don't want your junk, Cain. I want something for real. I want something legitimate. Here, God is saying, Cain, look at everything that I've given you. Can you not give me something back decent in return? It was a part of the relationship. 
You understand when you have a friend in this life, you, you know, I married my best friend, Miss Krista, wherever she's at. I married my best friend. You know, marriage and friendship and whatever relationship you have, there's give and take. And there's, there's sometimes I need to cry on her shoulder. Sometimes she needs to cry on mine. Sometimes I need to loan her five bucks. Sometimes she needs to give me five bucks. You're learning. Krista says it's all ours anyway. That's great because half the time in our marriage, she always made more money than I did anyway. I love her philosophy. I'm not ashamed of that. It's give and take. That's what God was teaching Abel and Cain. And God said, Cain, this isn't going to cut it. Please step up your game. You know what Cain did? He said, God. Are you kidding me? What, so I can be better than my goody two-shoes Abel? No, he's a jerk. And you know it, and I know it. And he's not perfect, and I don't care. He blah, 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 blah. And God said, Cain, calm down. God said, my relationship is with you, Cain. It's a personal relationship. My relationship with Abel is that. My relationship with you is just with you. Quit worrying about Abel. Quit worrying about all these other things. Let's you and I get this right. And Cain said, I don't need you, God. Still to this day, you think to yourself, Cain, what's the matter with you? God said, God said, Cain, go back to the field. Bring me something pleasing. And we'll keep rolling. You know what Cain did? Cain said, no, never. What? And in my brain, I'm reading this scripture and I'm thinking, Cain, all you got to do is go back to the field, bring God something pleasing, and you keep rolling. You got this perfect relationship with him. Don't ruin it. Don't ruin it. But Cain ruined it. He took his brother Abel out into the field, killed him, murdered him in cold blood. God comes looking for Abel. He finds Cain. God says, hey, Cain, where's Abel? You know what Cain did? He smarted off to God. He got smart with God. He said, am I my brother's keeper? What? What? Okay. And God just takes it in stride. And then God... Blew a gasket. And he said, Cain, I've had it with you. You're out of here. Get a wanderer you will be out of my presence. And then Cain broke. How many of you know sometimes it takes some extreme conviction or discipline from God Almighty before we break? The Bible says, God says, he disciplines those he loves. Cain finally had a change of heart. And Cain said, oh, God, I can't bear this. I can't bear this. Please don't make me leave. Please don't send me out to wander without your presence. And then God initiated the first tattoo in the history of the world. The Bible says that he put a mark on Cain. Sometimes I think God got out the haymaker and that mark was actually a black eye. Whap, Cain, there's your mark. Whatever it was. You know what God did? God said to the whole world. He spread the news. I don't know how. He spread the news and he said, anyone who touches Cain, the vengeance of the Lord will come to that person seven times more than what they do to Cain. Listen, Cain just killed his brother in cold blood. He deserves death. Cain deserved the very worst that God could dish out, but he saved him. And protected him for the rest of the days of his life. Then comes Noah. By the time Noah and his story rolls around, God had absolutely had it. People on earth had lost their ever-loving mind. They were a sinful generation. And then what? God talked to Noah once. And we have a scripture somewhere in Genesis that tells God talking to Noah. And God tells Noah, go ahead and get in the ark, pal. I have found you to be righteous. How many of you know there is privilege for being in the kingdom of God? When you ask God to come into your life, when you ask Jesus to come into your heart, there is privilege. Now, in this story with Noah, everybody else on planet Earth was wiped out, dead, 
dead, dead. God saved eight people only. But it was a story of salvation. In those days, God, he did a lot of killing. When you're in a real bad mood, just go back and read some Old Testament scriptures. Make you feel real good. There was no red tape and court hearings half the time. God just called the shot and big things happened. But in those days, God dealt with sin a little different. And it was an illustration. And God flooded the world. And everybody died except for the one he saved. Then Jesus came back. And then Matthew, chapter something or other, where's that at, Miss Peyton? Jesus says, as it was in the days of Noah, so will the last days be. Friend, now it's you and I. Now we're talking about salvation here now. I'm talking about don't follow the ways of the world. I'm talking about God's redemptive salvation is for you and your family. Last week, Pastor Glenn talked about don't allow religiosity to ruin your salvation. In other words, don't get caught up in the culture of church or religion or this. Or he said these scholars. I read about scholars all the time. Most of them, they don't even... 20, 29, 10... They're taking guesses just like you and I. But there is something to be said about God's saving grace. And Jesus says, in the last days are going to be like the days of Noah. And you and I cannot get caught up in these days. We have to run to Jesus. So I gave some thought to this story, to the, to the Bible stories, and I wanted to share 10, 15 Bible stories. They're super cool Bible stories about people who got themselves in extreme trouble and then called out to Jesus, and he saved them. Last week, Pastor Glenn was basically talking to church people, church goers, people who know the Bible. This week, I'm talking to those people and also people who have never confessed Jesus, also people who have never darkened the door of a church. I'm talking to you who might be in the biggest mess of your entire life. Cain committed murder. Eve ate the fruit. Adam ate the fruit. They divided themselves from God. In the days of Noah, people were absolutely off the chain with sinfulness, but God. Say, but God. His saving grace is our everything. His saving grace is our everything. Luke chapter 15, Jesus sums up the entire salvation story like this right here. There was a rich dad. That's God. There was a couple boys The one boy wanted his inheritance early. He took his inheritance. He went to a faraway land and he blew it. He lived frivolously. He lost all his money. He ended up working for a hog farmer, the Bible says. And while this boy was slopping hogs and trying to just eat from the same trough hogs where all of a sudden it dawned on this prodigal son that even his father's servants, even his father's servants ate better than he did. And it finally clicked. So the boy got up. And he started to run back home, but he slowed down a couple few times. You know he did because he began to think, oh no, I discredited my dad. I severed that relationship. I disowned my father. I spent all of his hard-earned money on my ridiculousness. He'll never have me back. What am I doing? What am I thinking? I'm at the very end of everything I've ever known. And on his way back, to his father's property. The dad got word he was coming. You know what the dad did? The dad started off after his son. And when he found his son, he embraced him. And he turned, the father turned to his servants and he said, Kill the biggest, fattest calf you can find. Tonight we're partying hard. My son has come home. My son was dead, but now he's alive, and I couldn't be any happier. In your life, salvation is your everything. It's your every single thing. 
It's because of your salvation that you can call out for healing. It's because of your salvation you can call out for protection. It's because of your salvation you have a personal relationship with God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit, our helper. God loves you. Yes, there is a hell and a damnation. There is an eternity where there's weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. Make no mistake about it. But when Jesus came to this planet, he got more interested in salvation, love, grace, and mercy. And he says, don't miss out on these things. Because what I have for you is greater than what the devil has for you. Follow me. Don't race to that something that you can't have. Friend, in this culture we live in, there's not just one thing you can't have. There's a bazillion, quadrillion things you better not lay your eyes on or let your mouth get caught saying or you get caught up in or else you get yourself swept away and you don't even realize what kind of sloppy mess you're in like the prodigal son. He was eating out of a pig trough. He used to be royalty. It was sometimes when I read these stories in the Bible, I think to myself, well, that sure was stupid. Why did he leave his dad's house? Oh, yeah, <laughs> I've done some pretty stupid things in my life, too. I can get sideways my own self. I just better stay tight right now because if I get the least bit loose in my relationship with God Almighty, I could be swept away emotionally, spiritually, even physically. And not even know what I'm doing. Young lady in 1996, her name was Tanya. She was a middle school student at Cornwell Middle School in Pennsylvania. There was a 38-year-old security guard by the last name of Hose, H-O-S-E, that convinced this 14-year-old young lady to run away from her father and come live with him. And she did. She ran from her father's house and ran to Hose's house. Hose lived with his elderly parents and his son. So Hose put Tanya in an upper story, in a second story room and closed the door. And she didn't see the light of day for months and months on end, probably up to three years. So much so, he did not let her out of that room so much so that he gave her a bucket to use the restroom in. He told her, your dad's not looking for you. You're worthless. You're sorry. You're a piece of trash. The only buddy who cares about you is me. And she believed it. And she let that roll on because she began to believe it. As the years rolled on, Hose then changed Tanya's identity to Nikki. He brought her home to the parents and son, saying that this was his girlfriend. Sometime after that, Hose felt confident in their relationship, and he began to let Tanya go to the grocery store and run a few errands and things like that. Tanya became friends with a grocery store manager and they began to talk a little bit all of a sudden when tanya got out of that room and out of that house she realized her relationship with hose was way wrong so finally she gave her true identity to the grocery store manager whose son happened to be a retired police officer who happened to show up at the house in short order and get tanya out of that circumstance 10 years later. Tanya was reunited with her father and Hose went to prison. When Tanya was reunited with her dad, she quotes, I just wrapped my arms around my dad and she kept saying over and over and over, I'm touching blood. I'm touching blood. I love you, Dad. Dad said to his daughter, 
I've been thinking about you and praying for you and seeking you every single day for 10 years and I couldn't find you. I loved you and I love you and I will always love you no matter what mess you got yourself into. No matter if it's your fault, the enemy's fault, whatever. I love you. Tanya began to understand the love of a father. Tanya's dad named Jerry. Put his daughter's picture on thousands of milk cartons and all over the place. Looking for and seeking his daughter until he found her. In the same. I don't know what kind of mess you've gotten yourself into, and I hope not. I, hope, I, I literally hope this message is for nobody. I hope you're able to take this and share it with other people. But the fret is, the concern is, is that this is possibly for someone. And let's just not pull any punches. I know it is. Some of you do too. The mess you're in is not greater than the salvation that God offers. You cannot be separated from the love of God. Jesus came to seek and save those who are lost. And that's me and that's you. And I don't care what kind of church experience you have, some, a lot, or none. According to Pastor Glenn's message last week, this message this week, God's trying to cover all the bases. I had no clue Pastor Glenn was talking salvation last week. And I felt kind of weird going all the way back to salvation. But it's our everything. It's our lifeblood. Would you please stand? The psalmist David once wrote, Return me to the joy of my salvation. Would our prayer team please come? Then the psalmist David one time said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. You see, whether we're a church people or we're not a church people, whether it's our first time in church ever or we've been in church our whole life, that's irrelevant. God is such a big God. He can save us from whatever circumstance we are in. It's by His stripes we are healed. By His sacrifice we are saved. This morning, I want you to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that if you confess with your mouth, believe in your heart that He is Lord, then you will be saved. Miss Peyton, take us to Revelation chapter 22. Or maybe it's 21, I forget. 21, 3, and 4. I heard a loud shout from the throne. All right, we started in Revelation earlier this morning. Now we're ended up, uh, there's 22 chapters in Revelation. This is 21, 3, and 4. And the last chapter, 22, is flat bad. Go read it. Here in verse 3, I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, Look, God's home is now among his people. It, all the way back in, Re, in Genesis, you know God's home was with the people. It was with Adam and Eve. All God is trying to be doing for, for all of the world's history is to get back to where we can be at home with him again now John writes on the island of Patmos look God's home is now among his people he will give them and they will be he will live with them and he will be their people God himself will be with them he will wipe every single tear from their eyes and there will be no more death no more sorrow no more crying no more pain all these things are gone forever that's how God intended the world to be in the first place in the Garden of Eden. And we screwed it all up. But at the end of days, God's going to come back and he's going to say, all right, I've sacrificed, I've loved, I've extended grace, and I've extended mercy. I told you don't touch some things. And those of you that are not touching things, and you've called on the name of the Lord, and you're running to God and not running to the enemy, not running to the world. Those of you who are running to me and not running to the world, this is for you. 
The Bible says in Revelation 22, a new Jerusalem drops down out of heaven. The old earth and the old heavens are passed away. And then there's this new city that drops down. And there's this new earth and the new heavens. That's what the Bible says. That's where I want to be headed. That's where I want you to be headed. That's why salvation is our every single thing. Okay, cancer. Okay, sickness. Okay, mental health. Okay, okay, uh, um, depression, anxiety, stress, all these things. Okay, okay, okay. But salvation is my every single thing. And my relationship with Jesus Christ is my every single thing. He knows what I need before I need it. Today, if you want to make Jesus your Lord and Savior, if that's you, please repeat this prayer after me. Dear Jesus, I love you. I need you. Forgive me of my sins. Thank you for dying on a cross for me. Thank you for shedding your blood for me. I love you. I need you. In Jesus' name, amen. And then talking about salvation. If you have your communion elements available, please take your communion elements. Take out that wafer. This represents the bread on the... At the Last Supper, Miss Peyton will put up Matthew chapter 26. You can read the verses there. Now at the Last Supper, before Jesus saved the world, he said, every time you get together and eat this bread, I want you to remember me. Today, let's, we, let's remember Jesus Christ. Let's forget about the world and its toils and its snare. The Bible says, by one man sin came to the planet the Bible says by one man sin came to all of us but then the Bible says in Romans chapter 5 or chapter 8 I forget then by one man came salvation and today we celebrate that one man that salvation comes by and his name is Jesus Christ can we eat this bread together remembering Jesus Christ our Savior Then Jesus raises the cup of wine and he says, every time you get together and you drink from this cup, I want you to remember the freedom that you have because of my blood sacrifice. Jesus undoubtedly, maybe he even spoke of it that night. It's not recorded right here in Matthew or the other gospels, but maybe Jesus even spoke of the first time that his God and Father shed blood to cover Adam and Eve. That was the first sacrifice. Now Jesus is going to be the final sacrifice, that perfect lamb. And Jesus says, I'm about to start something new and it's going to be radical and it's going to be different and it's going to be wild and crazy and you're going to love it. And it's called salvation in the name of Jesus. Can we drink together, remembering our freedom in the bloodshed of Jesus Christ, our final sacrifice? Today, if you need prayer for anything at all whatsoever, anything at all whatsoever, come and see my friends, healing, salvation, whatever it may be. But I encourage you this morning to allow God to finish what he has started in your life. There's no doubt that he has started something. I thank you greatly, greatly for coming today. And I ask you to stay for just a moment while you allow God to finish what he wants to do in your life this morning. In Jesus' name.
Church, Tom Golden here. Let me talk to you for just a quick minute about our tithe and offering. You can give online. You can text to give. You can give by the boxes, by the doors in the sanctuary or in the foyer on your way out of church today. Uh, but in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 2, the Apostle Paul is asking everyone in church to set aside a sum of money uh, to be given to God's house uh, in advance. On the first day of the week, he actually says. And so this is pre-planning. This is planning ahead to give to God first. And so uh, I'm encouraging you to do that. I'm encouraging you to uh, set aside something to give to God and, uh, and then bring it to the house of the Lord. Or, of course, you can text to give or give online any of our various ways. You can find out how to do that in our church bulletin. But I love you. Thank you for your giving. And so because of your giving, our ministry is successful. God bless you. Have a wonderful Sunday morning.